I'll give you a brief introduction on rheumatoid arthritis and the biology of inflammatory reflux. I'll go through some of the preclinical data that informed the dosing parameters in the first human trial of, of implanted vagus nerve stimulation for a chronic inflammatory disease. I'll review the results <clears throat> from the RA pilot and the device platform that we're working on for future studies. Rheumatoid arthritis is a debilitating disease with an annual incidence of about 40 uh, per 100,000, mostly women. RA is characterized uh, by pain and swelling in the joints, morning stiffness, and elevation of C-reactive protein and autoantibodies. As arthritis progresses, there are permanent structural and functional changes to the joints, as well as increased mortality, mortality and an elevated risk for atherosclerosis. In RA, the joint capsule becomes inflamed and a host of immune cells infiltrate into the synovial space. A fibrotic pa uh, panis forms, which invades the joint and can progress to erosion of the cartilage and resorption of the bone in the joint. These continued inflammatory processes are driven by pro-inflammatory cytokines, and the successful therapies have immunomodulating effects. To briefly recap uh, Dr. Olofsson's excellent presentation from, the, from this morning, the inflammatory reflex is a physiological mechanism that the central nervous system uses to maintain immunological homeostasis. The reflex contains, uh, uh, contains an, an afferent arm that travels within the vagus through which the, CS, uh, the, the central nervous system senses peripheral inflammation and reflexively sends anti-inflammatory signaling back down the vagus nerve through a pathway termed the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. The action potentials sent down the vagus nerve are translated into neurotransmitters, which have direct effect on cells of the lymphocytic and reticuloendothelial systems. You've seen this, this slide, but I, I just want to recap that the seminal experiments performed in this building by Dr. Tracy and colleagues have demonstrated the feasibility of treating systemic inflammation by stimulating the vagus nerve electrically, activating the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. The figure on the left demonstrates that the vagus nerve exerts a tonic inhibition on TNF release in endotoxemia, and that stimulating the vagus nerve reduces TNF release. Following vagotomy in mice, the systemic um, TNF uh, released in, in response to endotoxin challenge was significantly increased over the sham, and that electri electrically stimulating the distal, cuts, uh, the distal stump of the cut vagus significantly decreased TNF release. This effect was demonstrated shortly thereafter to be dependent on the alpha-7 subunit of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor as vagus nerve stimulation reduced TNF in mice that have competent alpha-7 but was ineffective in alpha-7 knockout mice. Stimulation of the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway has also been used successfully uh, to treat collagen-induced arthritis, the well-established rodent model of rheumatoid arthritis. It has been demonstrated that vagotomy, as well as alpha-7, um, acetyl, uh, as well as um, alpha-7 acetylcholine receptor knockout, uh, worsens the disease, and that vagus nerve stimulation or alpha-7 agonists improves the clinical score. This is a data demonstrating the efficacy of vagus nerve stimulation in collagen-induced arthritis. In this experiment, arthritis was induced in rats that had had percutaneous electrodes implanted around the vagus nerve. P VNS was performed once daily from the day of clinical onset until day 16. The panel on the left tracks the ankle diameter over time and demonstrates that the vagus nerve stimulation in, in black uh, reduces joint swelling in rats uh, uh, as compared to uh, implanted but unstimulated rats in white. The figure on the right demonstrates the reduction in the histopathology scoring for joint inflammation, panis, cartilage damage, and, and bone resorption due to vagus nerve stimulation. The accumulated preclinical data was convincing enough for, uh, for us to move vagus nerve stimulation into translational human trials in rheumatoid arthritis. To set the dosing parameters in our first proof of concept study in clinical patients, we carefully considered the repeatable, yet sometimes surprising characteristics of therapeutic vagus nerve stimulation that we've learned about in our animal studies. 
An important characteristic of the neurostimulation of the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway is that very brief periods of electrical stimulation elicit prolonged reduction in inflammation in inflammatory mediator release. The implication is that the therapeutic effect can likely be achieved chronically with low, uh, with low duty cycle stimulation, meaning the stimulation delivered would be very infrequent. This aspect will enable some unique device designs, which you'll see later on in this presentation. The first evidence of this characteristic was demonstrated in mouse endotoxemia. On the left, a single 30-second dose of electrical vagus nerve stimulation was performed in mice, and endotoxin was injected up to 72 hours later. There was significant suppression in TNF release at 2, 24, and even 48 hours post-VNS. We've subsequently confirmed this prolonged anti-inflammatory effect in large mammals using chronically implanted canines. The figure on the right demonstrates uh, that increasing the duration of the vagus nerve stimulation from 30 seconds out to 20 minutes does not further suppress the blood response to endotoxin. Taking all of our experience from preclinical studies of vagus nerve stimulation and inflammation, we set the dosing for our first in man study. In the study, we wanted to be confident that the threshold for activating the cholinergic anti-inflammatory anti pathway was reached. So we titrated the output current <coughs> upward as tolerated, um, aiming for between one and two milliamps, which, which is on par with, um, someone mentioned, um, vagus nerve stimulation for epilepsy. We stimulated for just 60 seconds per day and increased to 60 seconds uh, four times a day if there was insufficient clinical response to the treatment. We set the pulse width at 250 microseconds and the frequency at 10 hertz, parameters which have been shown to recruit fewer muscle fibers than higher frequency vagus nerve stimulation. I'd like to now take you through the design and, re and results of our study. But before I go through the first men's study for vagus nerve stimulation in RA patients, I'd like to just take a minute to go over the therapeutic endpoint. Implanting a neurostimulation device in RA patients was unprecedented, and so we set out to produce clinical readouts that are similar to the historic drug studies in this field, so we can show that we're just as good or better than what's out there. The endpoint that is popular in European studies like ours is the DAS score. This takes four assessments, the tender and swollen joint scores out of the 28 joints shown here on the right, the patient global disease activity score, which is a visual analog score that the patient says how, how, uh, how their disease is on the scale of 1 to 100, and gives them a weighted average, resulting in a single score on a 1 to 10 scale. For this study, we implanted the commercially available vagus nerve stimulators that are approved to treat medically refractory epilepsy. They were implanted in the standard manner. However, the existing onboard programs were designed for high duty cycle applications, meaning that they normally stimulate 25 to 40 percent of the day. We therefore had to rely on a on handheld actuator, magnetic actuator, that the subject would pass over the implant to initiate a 60 second pulse. At the study conclusion, patients would, could either undergo surgical removal of the device, keep the device in place, but permanently inactivated, or continue on a long-term safety extension protocol. In all, um, all eight patients enrolled opted to continue in the extension protocol, which is ongoing. The device we use has two components, a bipolar lead with helical coils that are implanted about the vagus nerve, and the pulse generator that is placed within a pocket that's created in the chest. The lead is tunneled down from the neck to the pulse generator in the chest. The implantation with this device is fairly involved. Each of the two helical leads and one anchor lead has to be wrapped around the isolated vagus nerve, a process in which care must be taken not to install backwards. The lead body is then, um, is then looped and tied down and tunneled down to the chest, where it's screwed down into the pulse generator, which is then inserted into the pocket. The device is programmed wirelessly um, by the study physicians in the clinic. I wanted to bring a few of the baseline characteristics in our study population to your attention. First, we've recruited an equal number of men and women into our study, um, which is usually skewed towards female enrollment. For this arm of the study, we recruited patients that were naive to biologics, such as anti-TNF, but whose disease was not sufficiently controlled by DMARDs, such as methotrexate alone. 
We did allow subjects treated uh, uh, briefly with biologics that failed due to safety and tolerability, but not uh, due to efficacy. This study contained three such patients. Most of the patients were positive for rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP antibodies indicating well-established disease. And you see our, our study centers across Europe were in uh, Amsterdam, uh, Bosnia, and Croatia. The baseline deaths in our, in, in our subjects were, was uh, 6 out of 10, and both the patient's self-assessment of pain and physician global assessment of disease were about 70 out of 100, indicating that this cohort had fairly debilitating disease. This eight-patient proof-of-concept study was designed to be open-label with an open, treatable, open treatment withdrawal period. The subjects were screened at baseline, then implanted a couple of weeks later, um, which included a single intraoperative uh, stimulation uh, during a diagnostic test. On day zero, the subjects were stimulated once for 60 seconds and then returned to the clinic for follow-up um, on blood markers until day seven. From day seven to day 28, the subjects were stimulated once daily, as described. Starting from day 28 uh, to our primary endpoint at day 42, subjects that had, had inadequate response to the vagus nerve stimulation uh, treatment uh, were stimulated four times a day, while those with an adequate response remained on once daily VNS. Between day 42 and day 46, uh, treatment was, was temporarily halted, and we expected to see some worsening of disease. Between day 56 uh, and day 84, the subjects were once again stimulated at their, day 20, uh, at their day 42 levels until the end of the study. And this is the most important slide in, 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 the, uh, in the talk. Uh, this figure shows the individual DAS scores of the patients over time. And I'd like to point out a few important uh, features in this first cohort. First, those who responded to, uh, to vagus nerve stimulation treatment um, improved their, skin, their clinical scores quickly and robustly. Second, a few of the subjects seemed to improve uh, between the screening day and day zero, um, which we think may be due to the brief intraoperative stimulation. It's also notable that the disease in those subjects who did not respond to vagus nerve stimulation in red remained, fa uh, remained fairly constant throughout the study. Anecdotally, patient number one uh, here in black uh, is a middle-aged bus, uh, bus drive, uh, truck driver um, who had to stop working uh, due to his debilitating RA. His scores dropped a little from baseline to day zero and then dropped precipitously after, that first six, after the single 60-second stimulation. We noticed that his disease initially bounced back between days uh, seven and 14, which surprised us because he had uh, already started once daily stimulation. Um, this may partly be due to the stimulation hiatus in that first week, uh, but we found out about a confounding factor. He was so excited about how he felt, how well he was feeling um, after that first week that he went out and played uh, a round of table tennis for the first time in years, injuring himself and aggravating his knee. <laughs> so fortunately, uh, he recovered from that and uh, is doing well. Uh, he's self-stimulating three years out and, uh, and being much more careful. <laughs> At that day 42 um, endpoint, um, the serum biomarkers of, of inflammation were consistent with our DAS response. Both IL-6 and TNF were reduced in the DAS responder group by 50 to 60 percent, and unchanged or even a little elevated um, in the DAS non-responders. This figure shows the average change in DAS beyond the primary endpoint and out to the end of the study. We can readily see the initial uh, drop uh, in DAS following the intraoperative diagnostic and the dramatic drop after a single 60-second stimulation on day zero. From day 14 out to day 42, there's a fairly steady period of continued clinical improvement. As we expected, the subjects got worse during the treatment withdrawal period. Uh, once therapy is reinstated, the subjects began improving once more, and while not quite to their earlier levels, there was a preservation in re of response in the majority of the initial responders. This figure tracks the responsiveness of the blood of the patients to ex vivo LPS challenge over the course of the study in red and plots it against the, the change in deaths in blue that, that I just showed you. Now this is what we call the whole blood assay where um, in addition to this, 
biomarkers that we detect in the blood, we also challenge the whole blood taken from the patient with endotoxin and measure the response, measure how much TNF is produced in that blood over time, which is really a, a, um, a, a snapshot of the, of the inflammatory state of those circulating cells. TNF release, um, in, this fig in this figure, TNF release over the 24 hours is marked on the right y-axis. The data show that the ex vivo blood responsiveness of LPS tracks the DAS score fairly well and bridges back to our, our preclinical data where parameters of first stimulation were worked out using LPS responsiveness as the readout. We didn't see any serious adverse events and none of the patients withdrew from the study based on adverse events. We saw no adverse events that were related directly to the device or the therapy. Rather, they were related to the surgical implantation. These events, such as hoarseness, numbness, and tingling, are known surgical side effects for this de particular device. In summary, the treatment resulted in significant and clinically meaningful improvement in signs and symptoms at the day 42 primary endpoint, um, including both ACR and ULAR responses in six of the eight patients. There was a loss of efficacy, um, as expected, following temporary treatment uh, disruption after the day 42 visit. There was a partial recapture of the effect at day 84 following reinstitution of treatment with a preservation of response in the majority of the initial ACR responders. Whole blood assays, uh, serum cytokine and CRP changes were generally consistent with the changes in DAS and past preclinical findings. And the treatment was generally well tolerated with an adverse event profile consistent with that seen in other studies using this device. With the remaining time, I'd like to introduce you to the, to the device platform that we're developing for future clinical studies. Because our, in, our indication requires only 60 seconds of stimulation a day, our low duty cycle, we were able to shrink the battery and other components to fit within what we call the microregulator which is a self-contained stimulator that has a groove like a saddle uh, that fits directly on the vagus nerve and contains the electrodes on its inside surface. The microregulator is held in place on the nerve by the pod, which is an overmold that serves to maintain the stimulator in place and at the same time um, act as an electrical shield. The energizer um, is, a, is a collar that contains a charging coil which is used to recharge the implant and provides a telemetry interface for programming the implant. The energizer would only be need to be worn uh, briefly for recharging um, every few weeks or so. Finally, the prescription pad is an iPad-based application that the phys physician will use to control the implant. The implantation procedure for the microregulator is very straightforward, demonstrated here in canine. The pod is folded uh, placed under the vagus nerve and re-expanded. The microregulator is then fitted on the vagus nerve within the pod and the pod is secured with a single stitch. We undertook a two-month preclinical uh, safety study in dogs using the microregulator and pod. Ultrasound evaluation showed no interference with the major blood vessels in the vicinity of the vagus nerve with the, with the MR and, and pod in place. At necropsy, we noted a fairly thin fibrous encapsulation around the pod, which uh, is easy to open and may even facilitate the replacement of the microregulator. Additionally, the vagus nerve had no signs of axonal injury on histological analysis. To summarize, the inflammatory reflex regulates innate and adoptive immunity uh, to maintain an appropriate response to injury and infection. The reflex can be driven in states of dysregulated immunity such as RA, using an active implantable medical device. Preclinical experiments predict that brief periods of stimulation have a prolonged biological effect. A human proof of concept study in RA showed good evidence of activity and treatment was well tolerated. Further controlled studies are warranted and in the works. Setpoint's device platform offers great advantages for this application as well as other peripheral nerve uh, stimulation applications. Thank you.